Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, wanted to be here in front of the committee once again here. Yeah. For the record, my name is Representative Al Baldassau, Washington County, District 3, which includes Robert and Lundbury. I come here uh, to introduce HB 145, pretty much as introduced. Um, and the bill pretty much permits the audio and video recording of any public official while in the course of his or her duties. I'm going to try not to read about what I said in the last time because it looked like most of you were there on, on the last one, so I'm not going to go there. But I am going to touch on a couple of areas of why this is so important. First of all, House Bill 145 should be an FN number. When I say it should be an FN number, not for the state, it should be for the person that's behind there that guy uh, videotaping uh, and got caught and costing them thousands of dollars to prove that they were exercising their freedom of speech or freedom of, uh, you know, to exercise in the public there with their video cameras and voice thing, and they just happened to catch something that was illegal on their camera. And so that's the reason why I think there should be an FN for our residents of New Hampshire. But anyways, I've got an amendment coming here. Hopefully it's going to be here in a few minutes. And what it is, if you look at, uh, on the statement here, where it says any person to make an audio or video recording, the amendment we wanted to add in there is anywhere that person has a right to be. When I say anywhere that person has a right to be. A case here, and I'll say on a, in a home, where a ex-wife with bipolar went into a mood change, schizophrenia type started a threatening mode of a husband. And what happens is, she's, I'm going to contact the police, you try to hit me, you try to do this and that. Well, the smart individual, the husband, would turn around knowing that he has a recorder, could put that recorder in his pocket illegally to protect himself because he felt that he's in the ready to be threatened. And we all know what the paragraph A of deadly force is to protect myself if I reasonably believe I immediate danger of death a serious bodily harm. Well, this happens to be in the same thing in a recording when you were being threatened. The police have been, was called in this case and ready to take the guy out on live and didn't listen to the children that said that this didn't happen because the wife stated that, you know, you should, um, you know, you assaulted me and you threatened me, this and that. But the guy pulled out his recorder and said, wait a minute. Before you arrest me, please, I know it's illegal what I did. Listen to this because I felt I was being threatened. The police officer sat down and listened to the tape and said, uh, I can't arrest you because this was pre this was already pre-staged, a setup that you were going to go to, you know, uh, the cops are going to be called, stating that you made these accusations. Now, how am I aware of this? You're getting first-hand information because it happened to me. In my own home, which I'm finally divorced, but I had a wife for eight years who I had to protect the interests of my children. When they go in these mood changes, these accusations, call them to the police, the world's coming in to get them. And police take the sides, nine out of ten times of the woman. But they thought I had my tape recorder because I would have been in jail and cost me thousands and thousands of dollars to fight this here. In my own home, where the law says I don't have that right. The videotape. That's the same thing out in the streets. Freedom is a beautiful thing. Okay? The technology is there. What do we have to hide? Am I being taped here today without my authority? Did I get permission to be taped here? Do you see what I'm saying? When you go into a mall, you're being videotaped. The police will pull you over. You're being videotaped most of the time. Without your authority, the police will come to you with a recording and record your conversations. Without your permission, what constitutional right do they have to do that without my approval? Okay? I should have that same right. That's what this is about. We've gone on too long. If you take the, I didn't get a chance to make these copies. Somebody just gave these to me recently <coughs> on a couple of cases here in New Hampshire. We've got hundreds of them going on where cops are taking the tapes. Okay? Whether that cop was in the right or wrong, the bottom line is, that tape was taken for a reason if somebody felt threatened. Because I know for a fact, 
when you go into court, the credibility of the police officer outweighs the credibility of the person they brought in there. Because they're supposed to tell the truth. And we know damn well we have our 10%, if not more, that walk into a court of law and do not tell the truth. They stretch the truth. I see it in my own eyes. I've been involved in the courts for the last two years. In and out of there on the gallery of items, and other, which is another issue we're coming forward, on the lies and the deceit. And I don't have the right to take that there. I personally told two police officers, two brothers, you're a damn liar. You went into the court where these kids claimed they were drinking, but you invaded their rights and walked, opened up the door of an apartment, a house, and walked right in. And then you claim you had that right. How do we, as citizens, able to prove this with the technology we have there today? Everybody has cell phones. I've got a camera on mine. I've got a voice there, video. I can tape right now if I wanted. Would I be legal to do that? In here, as I'm a public official, or a police officer, or anyone else in those duties, uh, public officials also. And out of respect, we should be treated all the same. I am no better because I'm a state rep with all that big money that we all make. You know, uh, I, we should be on the same sheet of music. Now, as I stated earlier, when the police, uh, you know, they pull you over, they have that tape recorder without your authority, without your permission, they can do that. Um, I know in some of the stores I've walked in and just purposely, and I looked up and seen that I'm being videotaped. We've got to stand up for people's rights here. I understand that a lot of the police don't want this here. Oh, no, we might get caught doing something we're not supposed to. This keeps the honest person honest by being able to utilize your videotape in voice. It's a shame. Somebody can break into my house. I can have a camera outside. <clears throat> God forbid they can snatch my daughter and talk to one another, each other. I would never ever be able to know because I can't have voice but to protect my private property. Okay, and if I probably bring that up, it's against the law. I'd probably have to fight it in court saying that I had voice on my camera. And they had only the voice while they were kidnapping my daughter or any, anyone else's her home there. We've got to fix this. What, this is our opportunity this year to fix this once and for all so it don't come back every other year. This is a freedom issue. What right do the police have, like for instance, uh, in, uh, to, to, in Weir, where they took, uh, because there was evidence, they took the person's camera. What right do they have to do that? And then they make it hard to prove your case because it was an illegal taping. They won't give you a camera back here, and the police can hold it. So if that police officer was in the wrong, nobody will ever know. Because that police, that evidence is used for evidence in another area. We've got to fix this once and for all. And I, I'm, I don't know what else to say on this, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other testimony. But please, constitutionally, give the people back their rights of freedom, okay, to be able to stand videotape and do as they were out in the public. Thank you. Any questions, Representative Jasker? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Clarification on your amendment. That's going to make it so you can record anyone when you're anywhere you're allowed to be, or have a right to be? That's what we want. Anywhere that the person has a right to be. They don't have to be follow up? Uh -huh. They don't have to be a public official if you record them? That's no. Okay. If you're out, I mean, if you take a look at what's going on today at YouTube, many people are being videotaped up on YouTube, their voices and everything. They don't even know they're being recorded, and it's up there. Why is New Hampshire so different than many other states? We're supposed to be live free and die. I don't mind somebody recording me. I have nothing to hide. But I'll tell you right now, I've been threatened a few times. If you check the Londonary Police, you'll see that I've been uh, blackmailed, okay, where I've had investigations and other stuff that's going on. But I, they can do this to me, and I can't protect myself. This is our chance to fix it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative, I have no problem with this bill on its, on its face. If we're talking about audio or video recording, am I, am I hearing you right that anybody can be audio or video recorded? Anybody? In my opinion, anybody is already being that video and recorded. Uh, now, yeah, I know Representative Curtin, I'm not going to he's going to be coming for another amendment on what he, you know, in his, his feelings. Uh, but in my opinion, I'm whipping and videoed all the time when we leave, when we're outside, when we're out, you know, in public, in parks, people with their cameras. 
and voice on there. It's happening. So why don't we finally clean up so somebody, if they're out there and there's a crime being committed, that they're just doing their thing in the park and they won't get arrested for illegally videotaping a voice. The video, I don't have a problem with. It's the audio of Sam having a nice intimate conversation with my wife on a park bench and somebody's got a, a shotgun mic taping our conversation. I'm not a public official here. This is a capacity of my, my wife and I sitting on a park bench whispering sweet nothings to one another. I don't think you would want you and your, your girlfriend to, to be videotaped when you're having private audio videotape. Okay? Don't forget the videotape. The audio tape. Convert what's, what's, what's happening there. Don't you feel that? Yeah. I have like a, may I have a follow up on that? <coughs> would you believe that I, I have no problem <coughs> here? I'm in an official capacity. I'm walking down the street. I've got this on, and they recognize me as a legislator of being videotaped and audio -taped. However, should there not be some parameters where audio and videotaping should not take place, like in your own backyard, yes. for instance? Yeah. That would be a privacy issue in your own private property. We tried a few years ago to pass legislation where you and your own property owners could uh, videotape and voice, and that, that got knocked down. Now, if you're sitting on a park bench and they're talking nice with your wife and everything, and somebody's taping that, nine out of ten times he's probably a pervert. Uh, let's be honest. Okay, that shouldn't be happening. Well, you know what I mean? That should not be happening. They not people are. I can't believe uh, you know somebody would invade uh, you know basically your privacy uh, on that there. I uh, put you support that. Okay. Thank you. All right, Representative. <coughs> yes, Madam Chair. It seems to me, Representative Dollar Sarah. This is more, again, from your perspective, towards the police for whatever issue it was you had with them. However, having said all that, I feel that this bill is kind of too broad ranged in the fact that if a policeman's out there and he's uh, being videotaped and he's at the mall or something and he's trying to do an investigation, that somebody's out there taping could pull the whole investigation. Because I know a lot of times that they're sitting out there and they're watching drug people in stores and stuff. And if somebody's out there and everybody's got cameras and they're watching the police constantly, I think it's going to hinder their jobs. And I really feel that, in, in my opinion. Well, I, I was finishing. Thank you. Thank you. Would you believe, in my opinion, that's what I feel? I, I, <laughs> if I may, uh, Representative, I thank you for the question, but I have to disagree with you. Uh, and the reason I'm going to disagree with you, first of all, maybe I'm missing something, and I forgot my glasses. I do. Is the state police in here in the bill? No, public officials. Public officials. Public officials. And um, this is on um, public officials because there are, of course, the police there. There was a case in Nashua, if you all remember that, where the police had to go and they were very threatened. And the person there uh, let, uh, used the camera in that case there. Video didn't voice there. But now, nothing happened with the police officer, but they took the camera and they took the, uh, the video there of that camera, of the voice there, and never gave it back to them because the police officer was caught. It just so happened that it's some of the police that are doing more of this here and getting caught, and those tapes are being taken because there's evidence on wrongdoing. So now, would somebody stand there knowing the, uh, you know, that a drug deal is going on in there taping that? Uh, you know, uh, unless somebody's giving information, you know, the police are going to be there in this dark alley or whatever, and uh, classified information, we're going to make a bust. I, I, I can't see that. I mean, I just, I just see this as like it's working around the country in other areas, <clears throat> defining what is right and wrong. I'd love to see a police officer showing somebody a videotape showing a police officer did it, show the good things about it, versus all we see on video is the bad things. I'm catching in the wrong, uh, you know, thing. What do we have to hide? That's my question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mark, Representative. Representative, under this bill, if a police officer was interacting interacting with a child in need of services in a park in London, there. A third party could take that interaction, including the audio, and post it on 
YouTube and it'd be no offense there. It's happening now. It's a shame. It's being it's happening now. People are taking now and putting them up on YouTube without any authority, not here in New Hampshire. Follow. Follow. In the same line, if a state trooper is investigating a fatal crash on 93 South, there's no but no nothing to stop an individual from taping both the audio and the video portion of that fatal accident. And that could be posted on YouTube before the family of, of the uh, fatality is even notified. Yes, that's correct. And uh, once again, that's happening now. On oh, accident, on other stuff that have gone out and uh, being posted on YouTube. People driving by with their cameras and other stuff that are videoing. But the bottom line is the only way it, it comes at them and they got to hire a lawyer is if they were taping in something derogatory that was done or illegal by a police officer or a public official, then all of a sudden stop the music, we're going to go get them, we're going to find them. It's yeah. happening today. It's already being thank, done. Thank you, Madam Chair. This here bill that basically is going to protect so that person there that they somebody identified that you caught somebody in the wrong, all of a sudden we're going to put charges on them. That's why it initially started out with an FN to protect the residents of our state <laughs> versus other areas. Representative Castro. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you believe, I feel the exemption for emergency medical personnel might be redundant. I think that's already covered under the statutes, as far as interfering with emergency personnel, and I think that's unnecessary. Well, to touch on, uh, like Representative Shrill, the people who are going to take, the reason we did put that in there, because there are cases, you know, that go on the medical stuff there, and that you don't want to be seen. Um, so, you know, I'll be honest with you, I even forgot about that, that you know, and that. It, because it, do you take some of your heads and, uh, I mean, I've seen pictures that are still in my head there on body parts all over the place out in, in Iraq. Do you take stuff like that and put it out there? I, I can't see it. You know what I mean? It's something that should not be there, and I can't support that, you knowing what I've seen in my time. So, but, I mean, I don't know. That's one of the reasons why. If you want to take that out, I respect, you know, your decision as the committee. Representative Benelakis. Yes. Uh, Representative Bazaar, you have stated this as public officials, yet I keep hearing you say a lot about police officers. Do you classify a police officer as a public official? Yes, I do. For, for what? Uh, they're not a public official. They are a public employee. They are employed by the cities, they're employed by the state, and they're employed by the town. They're not public officials. They do a job for the public, but they, if you look at <coughs> a budget, you will see them under the employees list. If there's a technical question over what is a cat or what is a dog, or what is an employee of, you know, they're getting taxpayers' money. And if that's an issue, then maybe it needs to be changed and make sense and put put them void. Because you're being paid with taxpayers' money. You should be held accountable. Thank you. 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 I'll wait till we go to the second session. Thank you. Uh, Representative Elsar, are you aware of any time when this video audio taping um, has been done where the item was confiscated by the police and the police then used it as evidence and used the audio portion as evidence to convict someone? Well, there's an article right here. Activists claim police won't give back their recording devices. They, they have to spend thousands of dollars with lawyers to fight this here. They don't get the equipment back, but a lot of cases end up being dismissed. Meanwhile, that resident of New Hampshire, live free or die state, has to lost all that money to get the recording back. Uh, there are cases that have gone on here, I guess, that have been used. Gerald Baldwin, I don't even know if he's here. He was the one that was a case uh, that had something to do, I think, exactly with the school department, <coughs> something with contracts with roots. <coughs> he videotaped some threatening and everything else. Make a long story short here because there were some public officials involved with that. The videos were taken, 
all the charges that added and added and added. Before you know it, little by little, he was broken and put in jail. You know, because of uh, all the stuff that went on in his life there, over this videotaping of stuff there. I'm not sure you understood me. Maybe I'll give you a first mm -hmm. um, My question is whether or not the police confiscated the video camera and didn't necessarily charge me, but used it to convict someone else. Oh, okay, I got you. Because they used the audio part as. I can't answer. I can't answer that. I really don't know. To be honest with you. Maybe somebody else might know. There's a lot speaking on this. Yeah. Representative. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think the issue lies that we keep talking about back and forth about you know who can release information and can monitor. You know, you may be infringing on other people's rights. For instance, if a police officer or whoever may be less to release that information. So many things here have to be looked at. It's not as easy as it sounds. And I do believe in people's rights. I think it's very important they do have a right. But also I think we have to protect other people that could be involved uh, if this information was just released without being scrutinized and knowing what is happening. Thank you. Would you believe? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would. But you know, um, if somebody, if we have, we're a tourist state. If we have a tourist coming out of, like, I use Delaware where I was, that was my last duty station in Marine Corps. I can have a camera in my house with video recording. Any break-ins or anything, you can get voice and everything with no problem whatsoever. And utilize that as evidence in a court of law. Uh, but coming here in New Hampshire, I can't do that. So if somebody's visiting here from Delaware and they happen to be out in our park, and God forbid there's a rape that's going on, or attempted rape, and he happens to be out there video and he takes that there. Any voicemail and everything else. Can that be used as evidence? I mean, I, I'm just saying, with this here, if he brings that forward, there's a policeman over there not doing anything, then of course that man's <coughs> tape could be confiscated by a fireman or a other resident, uh, public <coughs> official there, who didn't do anything, can be, you know, dragged into it. They could put that person that took the videotape and put him in jail or you know, uh, start the process there and cost, cost him thousands and thousands of dollars in lawyer fees. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any written testimony for my you closing? Do? No, you don't. Know I speak from the heart. <laughs> oh, no, I will give these two <laughs> here, yes. Wait, he's going to give you something. I'm going to, yes, I will. These two will be good for the hand of the seeds. I believe he's right. I think this amendment for men was possibly reckless. Yeah, lemon. We have the amendment here that I discussed. Yes. Do you want me to bring it forward to you and turn it into you? Yes. Or do you want him to introduce what you're working on? Taking a 
uh, a video of a public official, public officials, okay, including employees and so on, are all servants of the people. Okay, so um, I think that uh, police would be able to make use of, of these if it is something that they can use as evidence to support the bill. Any questions? Thank you. <coughs> you have a copy of the... <coughs> Yeah, I represent the I see. Okay, Madam Chair. Thank you, Committee. Um, when I heard this uh, proposal, uh, when the bill was uh, um, an LSR, or going to be an LSR, I thought it'd be a, I thought it'd be a very reasonable. Uh, it, it happened actually right around the time that I, I had got uh, driving up Interstate 95 in Maine and got pulled over by a Maine state police. Um, the what I observed was the story that he pulled me over for was actually absolutely nothing to do with what he gave me a ticket for. And when we went to court, all of that was dismissed in, uh, in a district court in New York, Maine. Um, and all I could think of was how fishy it smelled the whole way through that process of being pulled over. And I wish that I could have videotaped it, but I didn't because I knew that I could be subject to those wiretapping laws that I didn't want to be a part of at that time and I figured I would just deal with it at the court level. Right? But it was dismissed. Um, but it certainly, it, but, but previous to that, I had requested from the um, Department of Motor Vehicles in Maine to send me um, the, all of the transcripts, all of the evidence, the recordings, the, the, uh, the videotape that, that they had in the front of their vehicle that I'm sure would have uh, heard uh, what was said in our conversations and the video itself, and I didn't get any of it. Matter of fact, I was told that I was going to have to pay for it if I would if I wanted that video. Um, so then I heard about this happening. I said, "Geez, we really do need this because you know, for a, for a lot of things, uh, when we know how busy the courts are, how overcrowded they are, it wouldn't it make sense if we could actually present that." Um, even before the hearing, and try to make reason out of it that you know this is what was really said in this uh, in this motor vehicle stop. But I took that a bit further, and I didn't want to limit it to only police because this really isn't all about police. This is about any public official in their official duty doing their job on taxpayer money uh, that has a right to be uh, uh, that, that has a that that we all have a right to know what we're paying <coughs> for at that time. So I want to make it clear that this is not just about police. Um, it's about all public officials and employees. Um, and scenes today, most people do carry around some sort of video recorded with them. Um, and it can end up on YouTube at any time, certainly to uh, limit the power of the state when they want to come down on you heavy for something that uh, you may have not done, but other than a score to settle uh, for some reason, um, I just think it's a real fair bill to be able to, if they can take you and record you without your permission, other than just because you have a driver's license and a registration <coughs> and have bought into that system of uh, being on uh, your roads that now is theirs, uh, you should also have the right to video record um, the entire situation at all. Um, and I've asked most people that I've talked to and I tell them about this scenario, uh, and most people are just amazed that you can't audio and videotape any public employee. Um, so I think it, I don't think it would be a big issue with the public at large. I think most of them 
don't know that you can't do it. So I think they would uh, appreciate knowing that now we can and you won't be subject to uh, any problem. And I, and I, the other, other reason was I had a constituent in Ware that I know of that told me a story and um, it seems as though he was videotaping some police and they took his camera away from him um, and the story that I received was he was uh, either threatened or charged with a felony. Um, and in my opinion, the last thing we need to do is create more felons uh, in the state for, uh, for reasons uh, for reasons of uh, expanding, expanding the uh, uh, law enforcement growth industry, let's call it, or in, in, in all of that area. Um, so I fully support this bill. I don't think it's an unfair bill. I think it's uh, I think it's fair for all sides, and we all have our we all have the right to defend ourselves, and uh, certainly. If everyone is telling the truth and in the face, in the in the in the spirit of uh, open government, fair government, good government, um, and if if everything is supposed to be fair and equity and equitable for everyone, then I would fully support uh, being able to audio and videotape any public official, especially if it would help you in uh, in some sort of uh, charges that could be brought against you. <coughs> Uh, eight, uh, Representative. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Representative, um, looking at this little bill, what it says, even if I give you an uh, audio with anybody, okay, and I still went to court, where would it say I couldn't use it in the court? Couldn't they still confiscate? Yeah, the court. Couldn't they still confiscate your material? Because it doesn't say that they can't or they can in the bill. It doesn't say that, it just says to you can audio and video. So if you want to go to court or something, it doesn't have a mechanism in here that says that they they couldn't, that they have to take it in the court. Unless I'm reading this wrong, I don't see a mechanism where it says that the court can or will not, or is it the discretion of the court to say, okay, we want to see that video? Maybe I'm confused, but, but I... I'm kind of understanding it in a way, but I'm not totally I'm because I don't see the mechanism that corrects what you're trying to do. To stop, to stop the police or somebody else from, you know, taking you material. There's nothing here that says that they cannot, upon after hand or whatever, take your material. I just thought I'd ask. Thank you. No. Well, no, I mean, I still stand in the chair. Right. If you've got a response, I'd like to hear it. That's what you need to request. I didn't think you had a response. Okay. Okay. But you do. Well, I believe um, in my limited knowledge of everything, that's spend most of my time in an auto repair shop, um, that audio taping right now is a uh, has its own laws that protect people from uh, from illegal wiretapping. I don't want to take it into that area uh, without someone's permission. So I think the last place I want to present that type of evidence is in a court. Um, if I have to, uh, I don't think I'd want to take that with me. I don't think you want to let anybody know what happened. Representative Wood. Uh, thank you. Representative Heichel. <coughs> if this bill were to become law, could you see this being beneficial to some public officials, let's say uh, police or department uh, roads employees? Or if somebody were just casually video recording a uh, traffic stop or a construction site and perhaps there was a hit and run driver that hit one of those workers, <coughs> or maybe there was an assault, somebody assaulted one of the public employees and ran off in the woods or something, could this actually help them out and be to help protect them? I think videotaping and audio, I, mean, I, I think complete 
as much as I don't really want to get it up, I mean, be video and audio taped all the time myself, and there are places where I can prevent that from happening, like in my house and hopefully on my property. Um, but I think any time that you can offer any assistance in any way to assist anyone to either uh, get them out of trouble or to um, uh, confirm that an act has been done in any way, um, I don't really see a problem with that. Uh, because there's so much in question uh, and and all we ever really have is memories and words and and uh, people trying to recreate a situation when uh, when you see a videotape of anything you when you see it and hear it there's very little doubt as to what is going on in that videotape and I think it just confirms everyone's uh, memory that sometimes is weeks or months old and who knows if memory is capable at that moment. So, uh, I propose to call this bill. Okay. Representative Your response to Representative Fields on, on this question, uh, why would you want to take a police officer who is stopping you if you could not use that in court? Why would you do it? Well, I wouldn't do it because it's illegal. Well, assuming, excuse me, uh, assuming it, it was legal, it just was still passed, if you can't use it in court, what's the sense of doing it? Other than an intimidation factor that they can work both ways. Right? I don't know you can use it in court if, it, if this bill was still passed. I would assume that you could under some sort of under discovery or, or whatever you call this when you present your evidence to the judge. Um, I, I would assume it would be admissible as evidence in court if it's legal, if it's legal to do. I would hope so. We need another law for that. Any other questions? <coughs> Oh, Representative Sherwood. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thanks, Representative. Um, as the gentleman from London Jones pointed out, you can record both audio and visual video with your cell phone. Just grab out a little holster and start recording. Couldn't that be a concern for law enforcement officers that pulls you over for a traffic offense <coughs> and all of a sudden they see you reaching for your hip, not knowing what you're going to bring up? That, that you may be going for a weapon? It sure would. And like I was always taught when I got pulled over, is keep your hands on the steering wheel and tell the police officer, um, I'm going to reach in my pocket and grab my camera phone. And I'm going to record this. Uh, I'm going to record this uh, traffic stop. And here I go. And I would certainly not ever reach into my pocket. Thank you. Uh, with anyone that's on. You know that there are devices that look like cameras uh, or phones that shoot bullets. I've seen them on YouTube. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful, right? Yeah. You have to do it. Be careful. I agree with that. No more questions. Thank you, Representative <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be before this committee again. And for the record, I'm Representative Coffey, representing the area of Merrimack District 6. Um, I was approached by a constituent in regarding this legislation, and the scenario that was told to me was it involved a gentleman who had been pulled over for drunk driving. And for whatever reason, the defense attorney wanted to see the dashboard cam from the stop. I got a feeling there had to be something there because I you think that's usually something they wouldn't want in the courtroom. So you got to figure there must have been something there that they felt was missing or needed to be shown to a jury. They were told the dashboard cam was unavailable, but the dashboard camera was in fact broken. 
the uh, federal attorney uh, told me that he requested the repair logs for such uh, devices, and he was told he was not privy to that information. That raises a concern to me. If there had been an, an somebody else in the vehicle that could have videotaped that, was there evidence from that that the defense attorney, for whatever reason, felt may have exonerated the man of the charge that he was under? Hey, that's concerning. All evidence should be available. We have good and bad in every profession. You can't name any profession that there isn't good and bad in. And I believe that the vast majority of those in law enforcement and those that work for us on our public highways are good people doing good work. But I can remember when I was 16 um, being told to be careful going through the town because there wasn't somebody that was very good about their job. And they had had some very serious incidences involving female motorists. So we do know that there are bad apples out there, if you will. The bill responsibly takes care of the fact of people, such as myself, who are medical care workers. A person who calls for our assistance or is involved in an accident has a right to privacy of that care. They are not in a position to be able to consent to any other type of video aid. In fact, they sign a consent to allow us to treat them and to transport them to the nearest facility. The bill responsibly makes sure that people involved in a medical situation, that the patients are not being videotaped. And I think that's essential when you're talking about what the public has a right to know and what the public has a right to concern themselves privately. It's up to us individually to take care of our privacy involving medical care. And it's our right to consent or not consent as a patient. However, the bill does say that those under the public eye, those not involving a medical situation, have the ability to video or audio recorded. And that is evidentiary. Not, we live in a technology age. You can't go onto YouTube without finding videos about any public type official or worker or people doing silly videos, whatever it is. But if you go on there and in earnest, take a look at some of the videos that are on there, you can see that yes, in fact, there are some bad apples that have been caught on tape doing things they should not be doing as representatives of our state. And for somebody to be able to present that evidence to a judge in the, in the form of a videotape or present it to the public to stop something that is wrong is absolutely useful in our society. It's not a harm to a police officer or a road worker to be on tape. I mean, as I've often heard in, in under law enforcement, what does somebody have to hide? Well, what do they have to hide if they're doing an honest job to simply be on tape of that stock or, or that job site that they're on, that they're doing their job appropriately? Great, wonderful, let's see more of that. I'd like to. I'd like to see less of things that aren't nice, less of incidences involving abuses. And maybe if people know that they can be on record, maybe there would be less incidences. And with that, I will close and take any questions that you may have for me. Representative Wood. Thank you. Representative Coffey, in regards to the section that applied to emergency medical personnel and giving them an exception to this, what about the situation where the ambulance or EMT goes into somebody's home. Let's say uh, it's an elderly couple and one's falling down and hurt and the spouse calls the ambulance, they come in. Are you saying that the spouse should not be able to legally <coughs> take what's going on inside his or her own home? Absolutely. Actually, that is correct, sir, because the only person who can consent to that would be the patient themselves. Follow -up. Even in a situation involving medical care, if I will, um, if I was in a hospital as a patient, my husband cannot consent for me. I have to consent for myself. He can only consent for me if I am unable to give consent for myself, and that actually involves some legal action. Well, what about a child who may not be of legal age to give consent, and the parent is videotaping the child's uh, uh, medical care? Because medical care is something that is so private and, and so individualized, I feel that the, to encompass medical care into this type of thing could cause a great deal of embarrassment and harm to patients. Follow up. Follow up. One more. What about a good Samaritan giving first aid to somebody who's being who's been hurt? He's not doesn't have a uniform and a badge on. Would he also fall into this and uh, be breaking the law if you were being videotaped? Honestly, I hope anybody in that type of life or death situation would be helping and not taping. I hope you'd be calling 911. <coughs> that's, that's such an extreme. You're talking about somebody who's literally dying in front of other people. I hope everybody else around them was helping. 
I, I wouldn't think that videotaping would be the first and foremost thing on their mind. Representative Gagney. Thank you, Representative. Uh, mm -hmm. Your testimony, excluding emergency medical personnel, is that in part not wholly in part due to HIPAA? Absolutely. There are federal guidelines that state that we have to respect the privacy of our patients, period. When you consent to me allow, to, to allow me to treat you, you do not give up your right to privacy. And I am forbidden by federal law to discuss your care. I can't go to Representative Swinford, if you will, and say Representative Gagney was my patient. It would be an absolute violation. It's not something allowed by both state and federal statutes. I, do, I know it's federal. I, would, I do believe there is also a state statute as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Coffey, would you agree that it would, with the high standards of professionalism we, we're demanding of New Hampshire's law enforcement, it would behoove them to behave as if they were being recorded at all times when they're in their official capacity? I think it would behoove all of us to behave as if we were being recorded when we were in public. <laughs> Thank you. I've seen those YouTube videos too. <laughs> yes, I think there was a statement that you made concerning uh, medical practices that if you can take someone or not, and uh, you go into any mall uh, where uh, EMT may go in to assist because there is an emergency. It's being taped all the time. I mean, within that mall. If I may continue, there is many people within the state of New Hampshire that uh, have video cameras protecting their properties because of certain things. You come in as an EMT with an ambulance and that's being taped. So they're all in violation of in the statement you just made. Am I wrong or right? I believe that they can't simply turn around and put that videotape out on YouTube or out onto a news broadcast. I believe that the federal statutes would have some type of privacy protection for those patients. I mean, we, what, we're, what we're saying is that um, it shouldn't be carte blanche for somebody to be show, able to show up onto an accident scene and uh, perhaps be videotaping somebody who has passed. And can you imagine the horror of that being out in the public eye before the immediate family has even been notified? If, they, if I may continue, if there a crime has been committed uh, with the EMTs did approach and etc. And um, what I what you are saying is that the fact which one would override the other uh, if it was to be taken in court. Let's say there was a couple of people that had been shot or whatever it may be, uh, you know, with a gun, and uh, you responded. Now, which one would take court? I, th I, think, I think I'm a little confused by your question. Um, if you're asking me what law trumps what, the federal law... Well, the statement I think that was made, and I want to have it clarified, is that if you're a new and to respond to then you're doing that for work. Mm -hmm. uh, that you're saying that, that you, you could not be taped unless you had prior permission, but if there was some, some sort of crime that was committed, then you had to respond. And the law enforcement may need some of that information. So I mean, which one? I, I think we're getting confused in it. Oh. it. It's that section of the bill isn't there to protect EMTs. That section of the bill is there to protect patients' rights to privacy. There are many instances in which a patient is not in a position or ability to give consent <coughs> to be videoed. So you're not talking about, um, you know, a police officer pulling over a car in the course of his duty, you're talking about a, in the police officer and the person in the car is giving, con obviously the person in the car is giving consent if he's the one taping it. We're talking about a patient who doesn't have the ability to consent. Yeah, what, what or, you, you know, it, it's, it ha and, and to expand on that, you also have to remember the federal standards in which we work under prohibit the sharing of information. Even if you as a law, well, I'll give you a, per maybe this will help. Currently, right now under the statute, if I take care of somebody, crime involved or not, and a police officer comes to my station and says, I want a copy of your incident report involving that patient care, I can't give it to them. I'm actually prohibited by law to give it to them. They actually have to go through legal channels in order to get a copy of some kind of a, it's, it's a, considered a medical record. It's the same thing as going to your primary care physician 
as somebody who wants to sue you and saying, I want to see your medical record. I can't do that. Law enforcement's actually held to the same standard. They can't just come down to the station and say, hey, I want to see your medical file on such a patient X or Z. They've got to go through legal channels in order to acquire any kind of information off of a medical report. But if I may, we're not talking about medical records here. You keep throwing medical records. Well, we are I know that medical, medical records, care. I mean, I'm, would you believe? I know that medical records cannot be released unless an individual but We're the talking about someone that is responding uh, to an accident uh, in either crime that may have been committed, which is totally You're different. You're still talking about a medical record because a medical record is a generation, is a is a picture, if you will, of what happened on that scene about that patient. I don't put things into my report that have anything to do with anything outside of my patient. If they were in an accident, what happened in that accident as far as damage? What happened to that patient if they lost? That, if anything in my report generated is from the scene. So we are talking about one and the same. Uh, the, the form generated is merely a picture of what I did on scene. But would you believe that I was an EMT in the state of Hampshire when yes. I got out of the service? And I'm going to tell you, I've had police officers come in and ask different questions on what may have happened. And uh, there have has been video Ruby? cameras that were all the different Thank you. Okay. No debating. Please. It's all over. Okay. Representative Ginsburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, isn't it true that uh, privacy laws make an exception for data that does not personally identify patients, and would not that same exception apply in the case of being <coughs> if the person being treated, say, by EMTs, were not identifiable personally? What's the question? What, what do you know if somebody's identifiability would, simply would their face feel, or if they have a specific tattoo or wear a particular piece of jewelry? They see their face and they but, are not identifiable personally. I, I wear a ring that belongs to my <coughs> that her and I share the same birthday. Anybody who ever saw a picture of my hand, any of my family members, they'd recognize that in a heartbeat and know it was me. For somebody to find out that somebody has lost their life via a newscast before they are appropriately notified to me, I find that very concerning. Nobody should be denied the right of being able to be told of something significant in their family's lives without being done properly and respectfully, which is what our law enforcement often does, to go to someone's home to be there, to be there physically, and do so in a respectful fashion, versus turning on the nightly news and seeing somebody. Well, if the video were done in such a way that your ring or any other identifying uh, marks could not be seen, would you accept then that uh, video could be done? Again, what is the definition of an identifiable when you're talking about a patient? Did I leave your house this morning wearing this suit? Did you see this suit later into a video? So you're talking about patient care. You're talking about a right of privacy of that patient. To violate it in any way is a violation of federal law and you're sharing that information. And I would argue that there are many things about a person that can be considered identifiable that you may not think about on um, the surface but if you're known to that individual, say for example, my suit, it's a little different maybe, um, that if you saw even this portion, would you think that I saw Representative Coffee in that very same outfit earlier today? Okay. Representative, where's Nick Boyd? You passed. I passed. Representative Boyd. Yeah, Representative Coffey. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were excusing me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I apologize. Yeah, um, I apologize. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Almost made it. Throughout this, you tried. Throughout this hearing, through the hearing, all sorts of things that really don't pertain to the bill. One of the things that does pertain to the bill is that if a law enforcement officer records you, they have to make you aware of them. But there's no such requirement if you record the law enforcement officer. Do you not find that to be uh, incongruent? Should it be the committee's purview to, just to require that a person say that they're being recorded? I wouldn't have an objection to that by any means. I would. 
Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, with your permission, may I give you a copy of an amendment and pass out an amendment to members of the committee? <coughs> I think that's a yes. basically says that any person may record a public official in the course of his or her official duties with the emergency medical personnel exception. The amendment says that only the individual who is communicating with the public official may record that. In other words, the amendment substantially narrows the scope of the exception. This, the bill and the amendment are both exceptions to the general rule with respect to uh, wiretapping. The bill says <coughs> there's a public official involved, anybody, whether you're related to the individual who's being talked to or the public official isn't talking to anyone, Anyone can record a public official while in the course of his or her official duties. The amendment is a narrowing of that and says basically that only the person who is communicating with the public official can record that public official's conversation with the individual. Um, the individual who is uh, having this communication may of course designate someone else to do the recording. He doesn't personally have to do it. Um, there is an exception in here, two exceptions. Um, the recording could be stopped by the public official if, in his reasonable judgment, it would result in physical harm to person or property. And secondly, if um, the recording would physically prevent the public official from carrying out his or her official duties. Um, one example would be if the act of recording physically prevented the official from doing what he needed to do, either because the equipment was bulky or it was set up in a certain place. Uh, those are the kinds of things I had in mind, but I'm sure there could be other examples that people might give. The reason for doing this is that I'm very concerned about personal privacy. Uh, the idea that my interaction with a public official <coughs> becomes the public's right to learn about, I think goes too far. Although I don't think this was the intent of the original bill, in theory, if I'm going to the Department of Revenue Administration and I want to have a conversation with somebody about my taxes, it's not clear to me whether this bill would allow some person, unrelated to me, to follow me in, into the cubicle where we're having this conversation and record this. Certainly don't want people to know about my taxes, which I pay <laughs> accurately and honestly in case anybody was and what do you have to hide? raising the issue. <laughs> uh, what I have to hide is that I believe my personal income is none of your business, Representative Warden. Uh, you're a nice guy. <clears throat> so, I guess the question before the committee is how broad do you want to make the exception? We all know the, the origination of this bill came uh, as a result of police in the course of making arrests, traffic stops largely, um, not allowing people to do, to do uh, audio tape. 
My bill address, my amendment addresses that, but doesn't go beyond it. The bill itself is a vast expansion. Um, on the one hand, if a couple of guys working for the Department of Transportation are digging a hole in the road and trying to repair it, I, as I understand the law today, they can be videotaped so that you can see the picture, but you could not legally record the fact that they're conversing with each other. Under this bill, you could. Under my amendment, you can. If, in fact, I were having a, a conversation with one of those folks, then I could record it, but another observer could not. Okay? So that's where I'm trying to go to narrow the scope of the bill. Uh, one comment or one amendment to my amendment that I think should be made, and it was brought about by Representative Pandalakos, uh, it is not clear that public official includes public employee. And I think that needs to be addressed by the committee. So uh, on my amendment line uh, three, you probably ought to add after public official the words or employee. <coughs> that would cover the DOT workers, that would cover the state police officer, um, that would cover the local police officer, the local town clerk, anyone like that. Uh, that completes my testimony, Madam Chairman. I'd be pleased to answer questions. Thank you. Any questions? Representative yes. Shannon? Representative that, that's what I wanted to kind of establish. You do have the notation, our employee. So, <coughs> are you expressing that you wish the committee or subcommittee to do that? Yes. Did you intend it? No, I, 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 I would imagine the chair will assign this to a subcommittee, and the subcommittee should consider that amendment as a desirable thing from my perspective. Okay, thank you. Representative Inman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we also um, concern the public officials mention local and state? In my opinion, public applies to both local, state, and county. It's not restricted just to state officials. The question is whether an official is somebody who is hired rather than elected. I don't have any question, that, in my opinion, that public official does include employees. But, because the question was raised, it's worth resolving the issue. Representative Tasker. Uh, Representative Kirk, would you believe that one of the reasons this bill was necessary was due to the law enforcement community, some of those bad apples we talked about, abusing the vague authority of the wiretapping statute, and now we're giving them the ability to prevent the public, you know, to nullify whatever we're going to be doing if it prevents the public official from carrying out his or her official duties. Uh, would you believe I feel that's very vague? And right for I, I do believe the, the, that's the way you feel, and frankly, I think you have a very important point. Um, I put these two exceptions in here to bring them before the group. If you and your wisdom believe that they're unnecessary, either because they're vague or because you don't want to go down that route, you can simply eliminate them by uh, eliminating every, on line five everything after the word communication, so the entire exception could be eliminated. Or you might want to keep the exception for number one, where uh, physical harm to person or property might, might arise. Uh, I put them both in because I think it's important. I'm concerned that the act of recording could conceivably, and I must say in conversation with someone in the hallway, I couldn't come up with a good example which might be a good enough reason, if none of you can, to delete this. But in theory, um, if your recording prevents an official from carrying out his duty, I'm not sure we want you to record. But that's an issue for the committee. I'm bringing it to your attention. Thank you. Point taken. Representative Mazza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Kirk, the thing that I like to think of when I think about this bill is the Rodney King incident. Uh, the the Rodney King incident. Now, your amendment would preclude that smart thinking, quick acting Samaritan from recording that and making that public. It does not preclude 
the smart thinking, quick acting individual from taking a video recording, it would prevent that person from taking an audio recording. No change, in other words, in current law. Agreed. However, um, I would say the, the language or the, the words used as they were beating Mr. King would be excluded. I believe you're correct, and as I said when I came in, you have two options here. There are good policy reasons to do the one and good policy reasons to do the other. My view is that the narrower approach is better because the harm, I believe the harm done, the benefit from the Rodney King type case is far outweighed by the harm done to all of our interactions with public officials knowing somebody out there is going to be recording at 50 feet with a cell phone or whatever it is. I think that's bad. I think that it's important that we have be able to communicate privately with public officials. Now, if you want to put in another exception for police officers in the midst of a criminal act, I wouldn't have an objection to that. But the approach that's taken by the bill is too broad, now, I believe, uh, and, and not supported. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Wood. Thank you. Representative Kirk. Do you know the answer to this? Is it already a, a crime or against the law to interfere with uh, public official duties by police? Um, I don't know that for a fact, but I believe you're correct. Okay. But this, if, if you're relating it to this, yeah. um, but this, I think, is somewhat different because you're preventing the officer, not necessarily intentionally interfering with him, but your act of recording in some way prevents him from doing what he's supposed to do. Um, so it's not that you're trying to stop him from do his doing his job, it's just that your action has the result of doing that. And so I wanted to make sure that we gave as much support to law enforcement to do what we hire them to do as possible. Thank you. Representative Castro. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Okay, you Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, would you believe that the Rodney King incident resulted in the LA riots? So that would nullify the ability to record because it resulted in physical harm to personal property. So you're saying that you want this to be allowed so we can have L.A. riots in New Hampshire? Follow up. Follow up. What I was contesting is that if, in fact, this law, as you have written it, was put in place, then a similar incident would be deemed, it would be prudent for the, uh, or in the reasonable judgment of the official to stop you from recording that because it's going to result in a riot. If, you, if released. That was my contention. Thank you. Um, just a clarification. That's not what I had in mind when I wrote line seven, number one, but I take your point. Thank you. I just had a clarification for Representative Tasker. It wasn't the videotaping that caused the riots, it was the outcome of the uh, trial of the officers. Thank you. Point taken. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in regards to uh, harm to property, um, would, you, you, would you agree that a scenario such as a traffic stop and the gentleman decided to videotape the officer during that stop and the gentleman was approached to be arrested and placed on the cruiser and the camera just happened to get tossed in order to make the arrest and either hit the hood or hit the windshield, would that be considered property damage and they'd be able to confiscate that camera? The amendment has nothing to do with confiscation. I think the reasonable reading would not cover the situation you're talking about. The reasonable reading says that if the fact if the act of recording is going to result in physical harm to a person or property because the camera, for example, is in the way. Let's take a different situation. Imagine state workers are pouring tar on the road to repair it. And for whatever reason, you get involved in a conversation with one of those individuals, and under the, the bill, as introduced, <coughs> you have every right to go there and record that individual doing his work. But the individual is dealing with hot tar and moving around, and you've got this recorder in his face. And it isn't going to work, and it's unsafe for him and for you. Um, 
That's not barred by the original bill. But in this amendment, under number one, the individual would be allowed to, in effect, tell you to take your, count, your recorder out of his face because either you're preventing him from doing his job or you're endangering him and perhaps yourself. So I thought that was important, and hence the language in the bill. Do I have any more questions? It's lunchtime, Madam Chairman. Yeah, time to go. Thank you. <laughs> you buy in? No. <laughs> The well, tax man took too much of my money. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis is fine. Thank you, Madam Chair, <laughs> committee members. Um, first of all, I do have written testimony. For the record, Madam Chair, I am Representative Steve Cunningham. I represent Sullivan County District 2. I'm here to speak today in favor of House Bill 145 uh, from a different point. I am a health officer in the town of Croydon. I, as health officer, am frequently, unfortunately, uh, rather intrusive upon the citizens of my town. And I will concede that a health officer is, is in a very good situation to abuse his authority. <clears throat> I want the citizens of my community to have the ability to record, whether video or audio, anything I'm doing. If I'm not acting appropriately, they should be able to take action against it. I strive very hard not to do that, but nonetheless, I believe it's their right. Um, I don't want to get into a discussion of the various permutations that have been discussed for this bill. I will leave that to the expertise of this committee, but I'm happy to answer questions. Oh. Representative Field. Yeah, Madam Chair. Representative, did you felt that your duties were, and you thought you were doing something wrong? Instead of being videotaped, would you just not do anything wrong to start with? Uh, thank you, Mr. Field. As I said, I, I strive very hard to do nothing outside uh, the scope of my authority and uh, to not abuse my <laughs> Any more questions? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for giving me the testimony. This is someone welcome to the regulation. I can do that. Don't be trying to yeah, I, know. I know some of you have been here forever, and then some. Um, we could break for lunch and come back in 25 minutes, or we continue on. There's 12 more speakers. It's up to the people that have been here forever. Okay? We'll if I may add that, if the, uh, the testimony of the, the rest of the people who are going to testify, if you've heard the same thing already, Perhaps if you have some written testimony, you can bring it in <coughs> bring it to the clerk. Concur. And it would, it would uh, shorten things down. However, if you have something extra to add to the uh, bill, then of course we'll, we'll receive it. Mr. Brewer. Why not uh, we split in half, no reason to come back with that half the time? Which have, you know, that would they want to leave, they can leave. A lot of us are already getting most of the testimony. Mm -hmm. come on in, Chair. All right, so if you wish to, anybody on the board wants to leave to have a little lunch or whatever else. <laughs> and we're, what? Are we taking a break? Yes. 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 Yes.
Right. So if we're going to do 177, are we going to get done this bill and do this now? Get done and then take out one branch? Now you can. We will just move on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you can go now or go there. Please adjourn for lunch. And we have 12 more speakers. On the All right. Representative Hitler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I finally got to you. Um, for the record, I'm Representative Dan Itza. I represent Rockham County District 9 and in Fremont. Uh, all of you had or should have my written testimony. State Constitution. <laughs> Our, part 1, Article 8. All power residing originally in and being derived from the people all the magistrates and officers of government are their substitutes and agents and at all times accountable to them. Not sometimes, not when they want to be, at all times. Not at, actually, not even just when they're performing their official duties. At all times. So just, just by limiting it to official duties, we're giving them ourselves a little bit of a pass. Neither were our founders uh, remiss in carving out exceptions. In part two, article eight, the doors of the galleries of each house of the legislature shall <coughs> be kept open to all persons who behave decently, except when the welfare of the state, in the opinion of either branch, shall require secrecy. There are no other constitutional exceptions. Any other exceptions that exist, exist because we give it to them and we are in fact abridging the power of the people's right to know for us to be account, us and the other officials of the state to be accountable to them. So before you give exception, and I, I realize that, you know, in, in 1792 they didn't have cell phones and cameras. We have some advantages now. We have an ability to make permanent record of events every individual. So before you allow us to limit the people's ability to hold us and other officials of the state accountable, you need to have a really good reason. And that's it. Does it say anything in the Constitution there that says that you can be videotaped and audiotaped? I believe I already addressed that. It says, I said that those devices did not exist at the time of the writing. The people have an advantage now to make a permanent record of anything that they happen to see. That doesn't change the fact that we are all, at all times, accountable to the people. Thank you. Any other questions for this representative? Seeing none. Thank you, representative. Representative George Lambert. George Lambert. Attorney General Rice. Of public servant, 
in RSA 640, um, which is much broader and, and maybe something that you want to use, but there needs to be some term that's defined for purpose of this statute. Um, the bill appears to allow taping at any time in any place with no time, place, or manner restriction. <coughs> and that raises a number of questions uh, about the bill. And I think when you're considering this bill, you, it, 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 I would certainly urge you to think about the enforceability of the bill. If you're trying to clarify what rights a person has, you need to be able to clearly identify when these rights would apply. So, um, my first question or concern is one that was also raised by Representative Kirk. Does the person taping or video recording, does that person need to be a party to the conversation? This bill does not make that clear. Under the way that the bill is written, it could be uh, my dealing with someone at um, the Department of Motor Vehicle and someone else in the line behind me just chooses to record. It's not clear what the intent is. Clearly, if it needs to be, if you need to be a party to the conversation, that's a more narrow bill. Uh, there is no provision in here that the taping has to be open and conspicuous. Um, and I, it's not clear to me whether the intent of the legislature is to have surreptitious tape recording, or if this would have to be tape recording where the public official is aware that they are being recorded. So I think that that's a concern that should be addressed in any bill. Another question is, does this give a person the right to tape record regardless of whether the other person consents or says, I do not want to be taped? Um, it appears that that is the intent of the, the sponsors of the bill. Um, I just would remind you, as I testified last week, that um, providing for tape recording without consent um, really does turn <coughs> out in terms of what it, what it currently is. Um, does it mean, does the bill intend that a member of the public has the right to go into a public official's office and set up a recorder? I think that Representative Aldisaro's um, amendment would address that issue because now it says any place that the person has a right to be. But it clearly the way that it's, it's written right now is very broad. Uh, and we need to make sure that that's clear. Uh, another issue that it brings up is, is taping permissible regardless of the impact it may have on the official's ability to do his or her job? Again, this was something that Representative Kurt brought up, but I was thinking more in terms of, you know, if we have someone, a clerk at the Department of Motor Vehicle who was trying to deal with a, a flowing line of customers trying to get their driver's licenses, and if there's someone setting up um, with a tape recorder or a video recorder that's impeding the flow of, of uh, the business. Those are things that need to be taken into account. Um, the bill does not have an exception for law enforcement or emergency first responders. Um, as I testified last week, I don't think that there needs to be an overall exemption for law enforcement or emergency first responders. But I think it's important to consider if in, in an emergency situation where a police officer is trying to subdue someone because they're trying to effect an arrest, or if an emergency responder is trying to respond to an immediate emergency, um, there should be some provision in the, in the law that would allow them to say, this is obstructing, I need to ask you to get out of the way. You can tape record from a distance, but I can't have you right here. Um, the bill would also create some statutory inconsistencies. Um, right now, it gives an absolute right to tape record. We have other bills, or excuse me, other laws, where it's clearly there are conversations and situations that are confidential. Uh, Non-public sessions um, of, of public bodies under 91A, <coughs> RSA 91A, those are non-public sessions, they can't be recorded. I assume that the bill sponsors do not want to do away with those exceptions, but I, I don't know, and it's not clear. Juvenile proceedings in district court, those are clearly confidential proceedings. You can't be in there for tape recording. Um, there are instances where there may be a public official, such as attorneys in our office, that are engaging in uh, confidential client, um, attorney-client relationships or attorney-client conversations. Uh, those are confidential conversations. So one of the things, I don't have uh, language to propose except for, at least it should say something to the effect of 
um, unless otherwise contrary to law or the communication is confidential, and then provide for the right to tape so that there's not a clear inconsistency in the laws. Um, I do have this, not in the whole narrative, but I have notes for you, so you have this. Um, but I, if, the, if the committee's inclined to consider this bill, I would urge you to put it into a subcommittee where some of these issues can be dealt with. And I'm happy to take any questions. I have a question. When I went into my town hall the other day, there's a, a thing hanging out there, right to know sign, that you can go in and video your town meetings. You select board meetings and your planning board meetings and your school board meetings. Why I'm not sure why they need this. If you can, if because it says public officials there, that's a public official, whether you're a police officer or whatever, you're a public official. Well, my understanding is that this bill would go to more situations where you're not in the building and there's a posted signage that says you are going to be videotaped or audio taped. No, you can't. No, that the public has a right to. It's a right to. Correct. Um, and they do in those in those circumstances. Um, but I think this bill goes to more situations where there may be a one-on-one -on -one conversation or situations where you're not in a publicly recognized forum for where you can be tape recorded. Okay. Thank you. That's Any other question? Representative Ford. Ford, thank you. Thank you. Good testimony. Is, correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand it, the current law says that two people in communication, if they're being recorded, it's a felony without consent of all parties, or part 1A, a misdemeanor, if there's a consent of one of the parties in the communication. Is that how you understand it? That's my understanding, is that uh, if you are a party to the com to the conversation and you're tape recording without consent, that's a misdemeanor. But if it's, yeah, if, and if it's not, if you are not a party to it and neither party under knows it's being taped, then it would be a felony. Okay, follow up. So, going back to our discussion last week about the police cruiser video I read, the recording somebody pulls over and not asking consent, is that a misdemeanor? That's no, it's not, because there's a specific exemption under the law, under the wiretap law for those situations. So for which situation? Right. For the, uh, the traffic stop. There's a specific exemption um, under 570A Roman 2. <coughs> Um, G? 1A, J. J? Yeah. Right. I see it. And that follow up, that specific J says, provided that the officer shall first give notification of such reporting to the parties. That's correct. And you said last week that the requirement, you, all the police officers in the whole state know that they're supposed to give notification and that they do that without fail. Well, I can't comment on every officer doing it every time. My understanding is, I mean, that's the law. That's what they're certainly trained to do with the uh, police standards and training academy. And um, I am assuming that people are following the law. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In the memorandum we received at the beginning of this uh, hearing, there's a paragraph that says any law enforcement officer when conducting an investigation or making an arrest for any felony offense to carry on his or her person an electronic, mechanical, or other device which intercepts oral communication and transmits such communication for the purpose of the officer's safety. Is that covered under the exemption as you were describing it also? Um, that is, I don't think it's exactly the wording, but, but there is an exemption for allowing police officers um, for public, for officer safety to tape record for enumerated offenses. So it's for particular offenses that are listed in the wiretap statute. They can, they can carry something on them. Without, right. without notifying anybody? Without notifying anyone. <coughs> yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Attorney General Rice, um, listening to what you, you just mentioned, are citizens then able to bring misdemeanor charges against officers who pull them over that do not inform them they're being recorded? Um, you know, I don't think that that is a uh, violation 
I'd have to, I'd have to look at what the, the willfully is. I'm not sure that that would necessarily fall within it, but um, certainly they, if, if that happens, uh, that's something that should be reported to the chief. Because okay. that's okay. not one. Thank you. Is there anything in the current law that says, that refers to an expectation of privacy? Well, when they define, the law defines um, oral communication as any communica oral communication uttered by a person exhibiting an expectation that such communication is not subject to interception under circumstances justifying such expectation. So we're not using the word privacy, but what I think the law is saying is, are you, is it a situation where you would not expect that it would be reported? Oh, and if so, or you wouldn't expect that type of privacy, then it should not be unlawful to report that. If there, are, if it's an oral communication where there is not a reasonable expectation of, of privacy from being recorded, then it shouldn't be a violation. Perfect. I hope you got that follow-up. So, a police cruiser trooper yeah. pulling over somebody on a busy public highway. Yeah. Okay. Follow-up, please. <laughs> okay. He can only write so fast. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. So, I apologize. So, again, if it's somebody's pulled over on a busy public highway, or if it's a DMV employee in a busy uh, common area, could either of those employees have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Privacy is not the issue. It's whether they have a reasonable expectation that they would not be, their conversations would not be recorded. So um, it depends on the circumstances, sure. And I, I think that's, that's, there's a lack of clarity in the law. Okay. Um, we have a bill coming up next week or the week after is on the definition of oral communications. You know, that was last, wasn't that the That was the hearing last week. That was another bill that we had. Oh, we had that. We already had the bill. Yeah, so I mean, we've been down this path. Uh, any other questions? Thank you, Attorney Murray. Thank you. Okay. Attorney Zibble. Good afternoon, members of the committee, college level general counsel to the Supreme Court and the judicial branch. Uh, one of my goals this term is to someday make representative showing at not um, <laughs> <laughs> today. It is not going to be today. But I still have that as a goal. I'm proud of you. I, I also want to acknowledge, having sat here for so long, uh, first of all, the great attention of the committee. Uh, and I noted uh, on a day when it was a little bit greasy out there this morning, this committee had first been. So, um, that's, that ought to be noted. Um, I'm going to have very narrow testimony, obviously, because my only concern is the impact of this bill on the judicial branch. Uh, I don't have any of the other concerns. And if you have questions, I would hope they'd be limited <coughs> to the judicial branch. I have two areas that I would like to talk about. Uh, one is uh, in court, and the other is outside of court in the courthouse. Um, in court, uh, there is law, um, case law, on the control of the courtroom uh, being in the presiding judge. Um, and uh, I don't think we could set up a statute where anybody could come into court uh, and just say, I'm taping. You could have 20 people standing up there and, and saying, I'm taping. Um, that actually, in, in certain kind of trials, could could have some problems with um, uh, constitutional problems with uh, publicity and and lead to overturning uh, verdicts. So uh, there are problems in the courtroom. I think the courtroom should be exempted uh, from this. It's within the control of the judge. Virtually all of the New Hampshire proceedings are audio recorded. Uh, and they are available to the citizens uh, for a slight charge. 
for the recording. Um, and we may get an audio recording of just about any proceeding. We are not into video uh, with the exception of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. All hearings at the New Hampshire Supreme Court are on video. They're webcasted uh, live and the webcasts are available on the court's website. Um, the amendment by uh, uh, Representative Kirk would have a problem in courtrooms because it says that the person communicating with the public official has the right to videotape that. So there you have a defendant in the courtroom having the right to stand there and video the judge. Uh, I don't think that is appropriate. So uh, I would urge some uh, consideration for exempting the courtroom uh, from this. The second part of my um, testimony deals with outside the court, um, but in the courthouse. Uh, I have the same concern that's been raised by um, uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, Rice and um, been raised by others about what is the definition of public official. Uh, if you go to a broad definition, uh, Assistant Attorney General Rice talked about public servant. Um, if you go to a broad definition like public servant, which basically includes any public employee, that would include the people behind the counter. Um, uh, and there are some concerns in courthouses uh, with uh, videotaping. Uh, there are a lot of cases in courthouses that are confidential, uh, and those uh, people are there and uh, could be on the videotape and of course they can go on YouTube and then, uh, you know, oh, what were you doing in the court? Um, so there are some confidentiality concerns uh, about videotaping in the courthouse outside of the courtroom. Uh, Assistant Attorney General Rice uh, noted the uh, fact that the bill doesn't have any time, place, and manner um, restrictions. And I would urge the, the committee to uh, consider those kind of restrictions, especially where confidential matters are involved. That's my testimony. Thank you. Are there any questions? Madam Chair. Representative. Would you, um, would you recommend an amendment to the bill exempting the inside courtroom? I would. I think you have some uh, some issues. <coughs> I think the bill runs into some constitutional issues. <laughs> As well as the courthouse itself? The court, I don't think there's much constitutional issues involved in the courthouse. Um, I, I don't think those rise to a constitutional level. There, I think you have a level that's already been discussed about confidentiality. There are cases in the courthouses that aren't confidential, whether you just exempt those, perhaps, or whether. But the problem is there are people in courthouses who are there for confidential matters and don't necessarily want posted uh, on YouTube about the fact that they're in the courthouse. That's a public policy question for uh, I think the legislature has to address. Follow it. And, and when you said that, I, I think of uh, some times I've been in the courthouse and there will be lawyers off in a corner with their clients and so forth. And um, depending on the sophistication of the devices, you could certainly record all that stuff. And that's why I, I would say that that might possibly be a problem. Mm -hmm. Right, because there are confidential attorney-client privilege conversations that take place in courthouses that sophisticated equipment may, uh, you know, may pick up. Um, you know, I know of no basis to say that outside the courtroom presents a constitutional issue, as inside the courtroom might. Uh, but uh, outside the courtroom does present some public policy issues and I would urge this committee to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a quick one, Madam Chair, to follow up on uh, Representative Antos. Uh, um, let's say that there was a specific exemption for inside the courts um, that you couldn't just generally tape record inside the court. But what if I had a case specifically in front of the court and I wanted it recorded? Uh, could I have a designee in the audience to record that for me? You would need the permission of the judge. And if that were the case, I would still be able to do that. You would be able to do it if the, the, the judge is in control of the courtroom. Yes, and if the judge gave you permission, uh, like when you see, for example, 
uh, coverage uh, by Channel 9 of courtroom proceedings. They don't just walk in and put down their cameras. They have permission from the judge to record um, in that court. Follow. Follow. If, if this were to pass, that would go away. The judge would no longer have that ability. Um, I think you have constitutional problems if this were to pass in the form that it is. There is case law about the control of the judge of the courtroom. And I think that uh, if you didn't exempt the courtroom, uh, there may be constitutional issues. You will never find me before the committee, those especially new, who will to say definitively this is unconstitutional. Uh, because those decisions are for the Supreme Court. I don't make them. I like to say it's for the people who wear black dresses and have a higher pay grade than mine that make those decisions. So I'll never give you a definitive saying that this is unconstitutional. It would have to be tested in the normal course of case law. I am saying there is case law that indicates the judge has control of the courtroom. And that's the way that there are rules of court that indicate anybody coming into to video or whatever needs to be of the judge. Now, it's in, for example, in the, in the public uh, the trial where there's publicity, um, that permission is always granted, although it's granted in a way that keeps the dignity of the courtroom. Because, for example, take a trial like Addison or a trial that just occurred down in uh, Hillsborough County, there will probably be um, likely to be many who would have liked to have their own recording equipment here. And the courts generally say, no, you're going to have one media outlet that is going to do a pool arrangement for, for everybody um, because it's dignity of the courtroom. Under this bill, as it's worded, 15, 20, 30 people or media could come in and set up their cameras. Yes, um, Attorney Zippel, would you say that we would, if we included the courtrooms, that we would have to include the hallways of the courts? Uh, what I said was the hallways don't have, at least on the case law that I know, don't have the same constitutional issues that the inside of the courtroom has. What the hallway does, though, I urge you to consider is there are some public policy reasons that you may want to consider exempting that. Uh, Representative Parsons raised a very good issue of attorney-client uh, confidentiality uh, that takes place in, in, in corners and little conversations in the courthouse. Uh, I raise the issue of people there for confidential cases uh, have some expectation of privacy about being in the courthouse. So I think from a public policy reason, you ought to give some consideration to what happens outside the courtroom but within the courthouse. Thank you. Representative Kennedy. Knowing the, that the county seats have many different offices, and uh, <coughs> when we start talking about what is confidentiality and et cetera, uh, I know in that county that the uh, one floor is, has very little to do with courts, and the bottom floor has very little to do with courts. But again, you go up to the second floor, and that's where the courts are. At. So would that cover uh, just the area where that second floor is at? As I heard, if you said courthouse lobbies, court, you know, lobbies for courts, that would, I would, you know, everything that you write is always subject to interpretation. And people are going to argue different interpretations. If you wrote something exempting court lobbies, in that circumstance as you described it, it would seem to me to apply to the second floor but not the first floor. Thank you, Mr. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't know if I should Thank you. Thank you. Captain James White. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is, for the record, my name is James White. I'm the captain of the New Hampshire State Police and commander of the Investigative Services Bureau. Uh, there's very little that I would add that uh, 
Attorney General Rice didn't already cover, but just like to <coughs> a couple of things. Uh, first up, you know, speaking for the police, there's no one more than us that wants to clean up the bad apples, and I understand the concerns about that. Uh, with any evidence that we, we take, we're required to get legally, and we can't present that evidence uh, without judicial scrutiny, as the courts look at it. Uh, I would submit that, uh, again, I think there's been some testimony that I've heard 10% thrown around as, as a number of you know, bad apples out there. Uh, with police audio and video taping of traffic stops, uh, that cuts both ways. That, that evidence can be used both by the defense and the prosecution. And uh, there have been cases where uh, there have been complaints against troopers with the uh, that, that's exonerated them, and also cases where it's uh, <coughs> confirmed what the allegations were. So that does work uh, both ways though. Uh, I would uh, agree with Attorney General Rice that I think as it is written that this is overly broad and uh, I think uh, last week Ms. Ebell used the term Pandora's box and I think it was, has potential open up Pandora's box of problems. Uh, I, I would submit that a health officer in a business of private residence is a very different circumstance than a traffic stop, a traffic accident, or in another emergency situation where a police officer is trying to, get to keep the peace and bring a, 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 a situation to a, su a successful conclusion. Uh, I do have written testimony or uh, written opinion from uh, Assistant Commissioner Sweeney that I will uh, give to the committee and I'd be happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any safeguards in place to keep uh, the troopers from tampering with any evidence gathered by their dash cams or destroying any evidence that would show them in an unfavorable light? Uh, safe. I mean, it's they're they're recorded on uh, on a CD, so I guess uh, that that's the evidence that they're there. I guess I don't quite follow your question, Representative. Follow up. Follow up. If I did something I wasn't proud of and I wanted to destroy the evidence of that as a trooper, how would I, how would I be able to go about doing that? <laughs> I guess, I mean, there's, there's any number of ways, but you're, you're assuming that the trooper would do that, number one, uh, and you could, I guess, destroy the evidence, which would be uh, against the law, which is a felony. Uh, or you could, uh, I know there was an anecdote here earlier about uh, a claim that the recording device was not working. Uh, Again, I think those those would be very limited. Um, the uh, again, obviously, I'm coming from the law enforcement perspective here, but I can tell you that uh, it's it's a very proud tradition, and there there are very few bad apples. And uh, we've made an arrest in this past year of the trooper that uh, we hate to see because that brings bad light on the law enforcement profession and us in particular. Uh, but um, I assure you that we're as concerned about that as the public is as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you think? Do you think? I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know that. Attention. How would you have a chief? Yeah, I'm going to say that. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I was keeping track of for the record, my name is Carla Garrick. Um, I was before this committee a week ago, so I'm not going to go through the entire song and dance again. Just for the record, I would say I was arrested on March 24th of last year and charged under the wiretapping statutes. Um, so I kind of feel like I'm the poster child for the bad apples at this stage. Um, you know, a lot of people have talked here today. I think perhaps the most important issue before us here is the question whether if you are on the job, you're on the record. And I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation to say to our public servants that when you are on the job, you are on the record. Um, Representative Belazaro had said, um, and I believe this is true, that uh, you know, recording your public servants is a way to keep honest people honest. I also think um, we should think about the fact that um, it tends to keep dishonest people honest too. And I believe that this is uh, the reason why this bill has come up. Uh, both the previous testimony as well as uh, the testimony of uh, Mrs. Rice and Attorney General Rice uh, was 
you know, they earnestly believe that, you know, we should try and clear up these bad apples. And I, I believe that the law is put before you with perhaps some amendments would help with this. So if they're, um, you know, if they're being honest, which I assume they are, and they're concerned about these issues as well as us, then uh, this law would actually help address that issue. There was a lot of discussion today about, um, you know, what ifs. What if the children, what if I'm doing my counseling, what if. But I think that those are red herrings to some degree because the question is really, are you in public? And that's not a hard question to answer. So if you're in public, you do not have an expectation of privacy because you're in public. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer in my opinion in any event. Um, Representative Fields had asked, he's not here directly to respond to, but there was the question about how these things would be used for evidence. I think it's important to remember that um, people, uh, law enforcement has subpoena rights under evidentiary rules, so um, if there was a scenario, they would be able to get that if there was a private recording between certain parties. Uh, to address the audio and video issue, I know that that is a question that's before the committee because of the way wiretapping laws are currently written. Um, I'm going to throw out my own what if here and just say, and this is maybe something to just think about, but if you were to only allow video recording and not audio recording, which in my opinion would be sort of self-defeatist and probably not the best approach, what would happen if, um, if I hired a lip reading service? So now you have the audio, you have the video in a different way. So I think that's just something to mull over. So instead of thinking about it as sort of this issue on privacy versus public, it's just simply to look at it as if, if you're in public, you are on the record. So it's an issue of transparency, and that's an issue under the New Hampshire Constitution. Um, with regard to the actual wording of the uh, law, uh, I actually, to some extent, agree with Attorney Rice. I think that one might want to look at those current exceptions. She listed a bunch of them. And uh, basically, she said, you know, there are other laws that uh, address issues of confidentiality, issues of juvenile proceedings, and attorney client conversations with the specific ones she listed. If you do send this to subcommittee, I would suggest that one look at those things and then possibly you could leave the original wording, not the other amendments we heard here, and just say something like, except we're otherwise specifically exempted by law. And then everything else just becomes an issue of, um, of public servants being recorded and being held accountable. <coughs> um, I had a question actually for uh, the uh, G uh, general counsel, but maybe another thing you may want to look at is he talked about um, the judges having control of the courtroom and he cited case law for that. And I would be curious, and this is maybe also a question for the subcommittee, but um, whether one could find the actual citation in the Constitution as opposed to, to case law as to whether judge in, in fact, judges, in fact, should have control of the courtroom. Um, I can testify from my personal experience that um, certain judges do not like the transparency that I think most of us in this room would like to see in their courtrooms. And because it is discretionary within, uh, within the judge's purvey to, um, to say who can and who can't record, that's actually a pretty big issue, and when I testified last time, we talked about, oh, is this a purely a law enforcement issue, and it's not, because it is actually an issue of why can't we record in court? These are public proceedings, and we should have the right, and I think if you did the exceptions, um, the wording I just talked about, um, you could both address their concerns, but then also keep this before... Um, keep it on the table as broadly as possible because if you get into the nuances of each of these what ifs, um, it's going to be a mess. And, <laughs> and um, once again, just you know, independent footage levels the playing field. And if 
we believe in transparent government, then we should um, pass this bill. And I am in support of it. And on the job, on the record. Thank you. Yes, you feel uh, audio could be tampered with? Can audio be tampered with? Yes. Do you believe that it should be certified to be taken to court of law in the country? I mean, I believe that they, there, there are proceedings for that within courts. Um, as much as private citizens could tamper with evidence, so we also know um, public servants can tamper with evidence. In, in my case, um, my public records were uh, the, the police department claims there are no audio or video recordings from the evening of my arrest. Um, so yes, they can either be tampered with or they can disappear. Um, Do you believe that uh, the judge should have the right to uh, say that it is admissible or not in the court of law? The, uh, the evidence, so if you're taking an audio or whatever? <coughs> well, I don't, um, I mean, that would fall under evidence rules, and I think there are various sections that deal with that. But yes, ultimately, I mean, in a case like that, the judge becomes the arbiter of the materials. Mm -hmm. uh, who do you think should pay for the cost? If uh, the technique to be certified is going to be used as evidence against another person, or that maybe they have a right, all people have a right. Um, I'm not sure say, I follow. Well, what I'm saying is that let's say that you videotape or the uh, audio or whatever you call it there, and uh, who would pay to make sure that that tape was tampered? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here. I haven't really thought about it, but I mean, I would assume in any sort of case where there's video and audio recordings, um, what would happen is someone could submit that as evidence in court. You would have eyewitness testimony for and against it. Someone could say, you know what? No, you started this tape 20 minutes after where you're hitting me, but I hit you hit me first. Or, I mean, that's what the courts are for. Uh, would you believe that would be average, all right, for the average person? But let's say you have a top criminal move into the state and they, they want to of course, uh, make sure that uh, they can take anything and run or anything. And uh, these people are involved in uh, what they call, you know, interstate crime and everything else. They'd be allowed to uh, do all of these things. Okay? Would you believe? Um, I'm not sure I follow, but it, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. So you're saying so some mafioso moves to New Hampshire and is involved in interstate crimes, and no, no. yes, they'd be able to videotape their better. crimes. Excuse me, no, that, that is an issue here. Please don't, in, please don't get into debate. No, okay. no debate. I wasn't talking about federal statutes. I okay. was talking about the state. Okay. And I'm saying there is criminal elements that may be in the state of New Hampshire that don't come under federal statutes. And again, they present this information in front of the court. And uh, who would be responsible to make sure that they would pay uh, to make sure that the evidence is certified? I mean, you know, anybody can, the average person go out there and uh, have anything to happen with the choose. Today, with the technology we have, do you believe it? Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that the courts, I mean, video and audio recording has been used in the courts for a long time, so I'm pretty sure they have procedural issues for that. I mean, I think it's a non-starter. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We had to leave to go to another hearing, but he told me that uh, Attorney General or Assistant Attorney General Ian Rice had basically expressed all of the concerns that he would raise. So okay. No cap. Thank you. The Eva. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Claire Young, I'm the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union. And this is a tough one that you have. The bill itself is, is broad and needs to be dealt with. But the issue of videotaping, especially in your own home, on your own property, where you live, if you have a sign that says you are doing that, audio taping on your property, I think is something that <coughs> I need to give permission to. But I would, I would urge, I would beg the committee to remember what it is that you're doing. 
New Hampshire has a two-party intercept law in place. It gives me the right when someone is calling me <coughs> or is with me somewhere who wants to record my voice to say, I am recording you, do I have your consent? That's what two-party consent is. We're one of the few states that have it. Mm -hmm. It is a tremendous privacy protection for your citizens and constituents. And whatever happens with this bill, do not allow this bill to be the, the vehicle to overturn that. It is a crucial protection because it doesn't <coughs> just protect me from having Verizon record my conversation when I complain about my service. If you overturn that law, you are giving the police the right to intercept without consent. They will then have one party consent. I don't think that's what you want. And that could potentially be the result of this bill. What I would urge the committee to do is take this bill, and one twenty-six, one twenty-seven, one twenty-seven, and not put it into subcommittee, Madam Chair, but put it into interim study. Because I think there is way too much here in the very short amount of time you always have to look at one bill before the next ten, ten bills come through. Not with the idea of killing it, but with the idea of passing it. But of passing a bill that protects the rights of individuals in New Hampshire to have the ability to consent or to refuse consent to an oral intercept, and also to balance that against individuals who may want to record video and audio on their own property, a property that they inhabit because of whatever concerns they have about the society we live in or about their interactions with public officials or perhaps private citizens that they want to be protected against. And there's one thing that's been bothering me since this morning when it was said, and, and I gotta get this one in because I gotta get this one in. It was suggested that the individual who was videotaping the rape of someone else could be charged with a crime. I would hope that anyone who is watching the rape of any other person would get the biggest stick they could and hit the bastard as hard as they could. I don't think videotaping is the issue when you are watching a crime, especially a rape. I think we as citizens and human beings need to intervene if we are able to do so, or at the very least, use that stupid cell phone to call the police. <coughs> because a videotape isn't going to help the victim. I just think we need to be a little more concerned about protecting each other. And I think the <laughs> Ms. Neville, uh, would you consider your private vehicle your private property? Would I consider it, yes, Representative Gaggy, but the United States Supreme Court does not. The Supreme Court has ruled that, in fact, there is no expectation of privacy in your vehicle when you are on the, the highways and byways of the state. If I'm in the car in the garage, I think I do have an expectation of privacy. Building on that, would you consider that one must have, if all this takes place, the right to the video and audio taken? Would one being videotaped or audio taken, would that person have a reasonable expectation of privacy? I'm not talking about on duty here. I'm talking about reasonable expectation of privacy in their own backyard, walking on the street, having an intimate conversation with a <coughs> significant other, the reasonable expectation of privacy that, that that conversation is private. 
Representative Honey, I wish I could, as a privacy nut and a Luddite, I don't have any of these recording devices, and my cell phone doesn't even take messages. Uh, but, um, I wish I could say that there's an expectation of privacy. I think General Rice got it right, as she most of the time does. I think what you have in the circumstance you described, the, um, the exchange of, of, of lovely words with your wife um, on a park bench in, in a public park, um, I think what you have in New Hampshire, because of two-party intercept requirements and consent, you have an expectation of not being audio taped. I think you have that absolute expectation in New Hampshire, and if you are audio taped, I think that you have um, our, uh, the possibility of pursuing the individual who does that, or asking law enforcement to pursue. I don't think you have the expectation of privacy. Um, I worry that privacy is becoming an anachronism um, when I see the things that Google sees and then puts on maps that everyone else can see, it's enough to make you want to follow uh, the groundhogs and live under there. <coughs> but the reality is here at least, we have the expectation supported by our statutes of not being audio taped unless we consent to it. Thank you. And thank you for pronouncing my name in a way it's really supposed to be perfect. Oh, I thought you were going to tell you. No. Excellent. Thank you. I'm all set. Uh, Representative Ginsburg. Thank you. This bill, as it's written, appears to me that it speaks only of a public official, and public performance, and public duties. Has nothing to do with privacy. Do you agree? Representative Ginsburg, actually, I would not, um, because if you are videotaping, for example. Um, a police officer in a traffic stop and audio taping as well. You're taking in everyone at the scene. And so individuals who might inadvertently be walking by having the conversation that Representative Dunne suggested, or even if they're talking about sharing a joint later at, at the, you know, at one person's apartment, they are saying things that they're not expecting to be audio recorded and yet they are now part of the tape. And so while an individual, the, the individual who is named is the public person, there's no suggestion in the bill that other people might not incidentally be part of the recording and therefore part of the audio record. Um, in that case, if the bill were rewritten to include only transactions of which the person recording were a party. And while they had the right to record, they were also responsible for informing the person being recorded public official. Would that satisfy your <coughs> Representative Ginsburg, I think that's on the way. I think that's on the way. But the other part of it um, that concerns me globally is that there is no limitation in the bill once you've made this video and audio recording as to where you can send it or what you can do with it. And an embarrassing piece of audio video, video tape, um, once it goes out there, it's what I always tell the kids when I go to classroom, classrooms about sexting. You put it out there and it never goes away and you can never get it back. And whatever privacy or personal information you wanted to protect, it's gone. And you will never restore it. And so the ability to make an audio recording without an individual's consent, and no limitation on what you can do with it afterwards. I think Pandora's box is not just open, it's still on the seat. I have one more. Well, would you say that that area of public dissemination, the YouTube effect, uh, is beyond the scope of our concern here, something that's entirely out of our control. Representative Ginsburg, I think I would agree with you that your conclusion is correct, but if it is, I would lament the death of control and, and, and lament that there is no effort to attempt to, to address the issue. I would do that. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chairman. With the advent of the internet and such phenomenons as Facebook, etc., do you think that the younger generation growing up cares anything about their privacy? Representative Welsh, I think that they do not until something happens. It's one of those issues that they share information and they really do not understand that there is no taking it back. And they really do not understand when they send sexting pictures to each other that they have lost control of what their, their naked body looks like for the rest of their lives, for people giving them, looking at them as job prospects 15 years later. They do not understand that. And so I think there is a, a reactionary privacy that they have, want to be able to expect after the so-called door is shut when the horse is already in the next county. I think that it is very difficult to talk to young people about privacy because of the openness of the communications. But I think somehow we have to get across to them that some of the things that they put on Facebook and some of the things that they send to each other will never go away. And they have done that to themselves. And so I don't know how to educate them about that other than that I tell them all the time. But I don't see all of them. I just see the ones I go and visit their classroom. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. I think I have a representative Josh Lambert. No, you called him. I called him. I called him. He's not here. He's still not here. No, Shelly Mel. Kim. Oh, Kim. Shelly Mel. No, Kim. Or Mel Kim. Kim Antro? Okay. I'm Madam Chair. Shelly is a constituent of Representative Lambert's, and I believe they went to converse, and perhaps after their testimony, they can call them both in. Well, Dennis got it. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I really appreciate your being attentive and patient, and I will therefore be lively and quick. <laughs> I think the danger in this legislation is that it's spins too many constructions. It is very easy and fun, and because we're intelligent people and we're used to looking at legislation, we play the game of what if. And my son, who's now reading World Doll novels, recently came across the great line in the, in, in, in the line of Mr. Willy Wonka, what if my beard were made of green spinach? We have, unfortunately, lots of actual, real, concrete examples of problems in the current law, the current way things are. And really, I'm here to ask you plead with you to please do something to fix the situation we're in now, specifically with respect to law enforcement. Um, I just want to bring up one or two. I don't want to go through a long list. I can give you some documentation on that and make Representative Sharon more happy than he already is. I want to talk to you very briefly about a convicted drug dealer, a not real educated guy, a not real bright guy, and a guy who deserved to be in prison. A guy named Lester Eugene Seiler. Now this small time drug dealer was visited by the police in his home state of Tennessee um, who brought him to justice, but unfortunately they did so after scaring his wife out of the room. His wife had the presence of mind to hide a audio tape in the room and turn it on before fleeing. The police officers from Wikipedia, used various methods, including applying electricity to his genitals, threatening to kill him, and threatening to kill members of his family. The five officers then proceeded, of course, to cover up for one another. Fortunately, the audio recording did, did come to light. I have for you the Federal Bureau of Investigation's transcript of that audio recording. It's over 60 pages in length. I took out a few pieces. I gave you the URL. You can see the rest for yourself. They include things like, I'm going to kill your, now you either sign this document or I'm going to shoot you. They were asking him to sign a document authorizing him to search the premises so that they could do <coughs> it legally. 
looking for the drugs that they didn't have enough evidence to get without threatening to kill him and they did in fact torture him. That of course is in Tennessee. Now, I think I'm not alone in believing that people are pretty much the same everywhere. But law officers are no different than other people. We're all just people, we're all just human beings. And human beings generally aren't born bad. And generally if you have a level of functionality in your life to become a law officer, you're generally one of the good apples, I think we'd all believe. But I also know that people and institutions respond to incentives. And that where the incentives are not lined up, the people will behave in ways that they are incentivized to behave. As it turns out, here in our state of New Hampshire, we are earning something of a national reputation as being crime central for police. I don't think a year goes by that I don't find another major news outlet describing a ridiculous case in New Hampshire. One from last year, a 20-year-old who was allegedly drinking alcohol, there was an altercation with the police entering his home. He was charged for possessing alcohol. I think it's something a fair number of the people in the room have been charged with at some point or other. But the felony he did, had to defend himself against was for reporting the officer, and reporting the interaction. The case of Michael Gannon a few years ago was mentioned. I won't go through the details. I have them for you here. I find it interesting <coughs> that Mr. Gannon installed surveillance equipment on his property because he was afraid of the police in his town, Nashua, one of whom, Mr. Gannon is quoting, saying, uh, they said they were too rich for the neighborhood and that we should move out. And it was, of course, those tapes that the police, when he came to try and log a complaint with his national police officers, saying, hey, look, I got the audio tapes showing that these police officers are telling me I need to leave town. That's when <coughs> he found himself facing a felony charge of possible 21-year prison sentence. He had to post $10,000 in bail and took that all the way up to the Supreme Court. The charges were eventually dropped, although well, he never got his property back. Police in Rochester, New Hampshire, found a man uh, sitting in his car, apparently inebriated. The man indicated that he was in the car trying to listen to the radio and not drive it. I guess he was inebriated. But apparently the DUI didn't fly but the Class B felony did. I can go on and on and on. These are not all from local papers. Some of them are from national papers and blogs. I fear that our state is getting a reputation for being the place where we don't have a few bad apples. The evidence that I have before us, the evidence that I'm seeing in the news, is we're the state where the incentives are lined up to make it real easy for the bad apples to institutionalize the bad behavior. And I don't think it's 10%. My personal opinion, it's a lot more than that because the incentives are lined up. Please give it back to the people the ability to record their public servants, their magistrates and officers, and at all times accountable to them, at least while they're on duty, at least while they're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that individual, at least in a place where they are already authorized to be without the fear that the law that the police know so well that the average show does not will be used as a sword and not a shield to defend them. And lastly, because I'll, I'll let us all go, there was a, uh, a very interesting thought that was blessed by Representative Welch. It's so deaf that thought is uh, an individual reaching for a camera that looks like a gun. As it turns out, I get these little magazines at my house because I'm a techie and I like the thing you can waste your money on. And You know, you can record conversations with a pen. You know, there are pens, or things that look like pens that are in fact firearms. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? In the case that you said it, where a pen could actually be a firearm, <coughs> if you were a 
police officer and you stop someone, and the first thing they did is reach in their pocket, wouldn't you uh, <laughs> react to that? It is my belief that we are responsible for our actions at all times, and that if I believe the best defense for myself is to reach in and grab a recording device or a firearm, that is a decision that I'm making, and that the responsibility for the results of that decision are mine to make. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you didn't think you were going to get away with that, did you? <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Bill McGonagall from Plainfield. Uh, I have some, I just mostly, uh, I have some right testimony of art. A lot of it is notes and uh, collections of um, a lot of editorials, uh, experts in this area, and uh, offering opinions of it on why this kind of legislation is very important. I just wanted to clarify just a couple very small points um, that came up that don't relate to our testimony specifically. Um, there was some earlier talk about the um, Representative Bell Sandro's uh, amendment with uh, regard to uh, being in a place where you have a right to be. And it sounds to me, it's my opinion, that that was occasionally misinterpreted as expanding the scope of this to refer to everybody anywhere and not just to public officials or employees. And I don't believe that's the case. Um, but I do believe that, that that amendment much more elegantly covers most of the objections that um, Representative Kirk's amendment uh, brings up, or Representative Kirk brought up the first year of his amendment, and that the Attorney General's office brought up. Uh, I think it deals with it in a very elegant way, and I believe that Representative Kirk's amendment, while well meaning, would have gotten most of the cases where this kind of uh, law is really important to have. So I urge you to reject that one and adopt the Bell Sanders Bell Sanders amendment. So all right, three minutes. Okay. All right, Madam Chair, RSC 91A, our celebrated sunshine law, tells us that openness in the conduct of public business is essential to a democratic society. The, the purpose of this chapter is to ensure both the greatest possible public access to the actions, discussions, and records of all public bodies and their accountability to the people. And we know that transparency encourages good behavior. The chapter <laughs> further specifies all meetings, whether held in person by means of telephone or electronic communication or in any other matter shall be open to the public and that any person shall be permitted to use recording devices including but not limited to tape recorders, cameras, videotape equipment, and meetings. We can't be in every place at every time, yet we ask our government to act on our behalf and so such recordings are used to provide an unbiased, durable, and objective record of our government's actions. In most cases of recording official interactions, the results are expected to be exceedingly dull. Everything <laughs> happens the way we should expect it should. Our issue is not whether most public officials are bad, but whether the state provides that very small minority of those who would exhibit poor behavior a veil of secrecy to be used as a tool of tyranny. Such acts among police only serve to sully the reputations of their fellow officers and damage the reputation of the state government, which seemingly seeks to defeat the very transparency and accountability that can both correct and prevent such egregious violations of the public trust. An accountable government has no tolerance for such actions and offers them no harbor. Over the past year, with the proliferation of both awareness and technology, this issue has come to the fore on both a local and a national scale. While the New Hampshire legislature has been working its way through this issue for a number of years, a few prominent cases, not the least of which being the notorious Bart murder, have created a crescendo of support against state prosecution of recordings of this type because of the essential feed of that feedback they provide to our system of government. Leading thinkers, analysts, and legal scholars from across America have concluded that both moral virtue and the march of progress demand an end to such prosecution. I ask you to support this bill 
and have provided references to several research pieces with my written testimony. Thank you for your consideration of this matter. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I have one question. Would you like to ask all day long? I guess you'll be getting bigger with my <laughs> If we do this, as this bill is written and amended and reamended and everything, do we not maybe make the situation we're trying to create worse? I would say, I would say no. It's, we create community. I say that um, accountability, transparency, and openness almost all the time make things better. Follow. 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 Okay, um, could you believe that wherever I go as a, not the state rep, but I'm the overseer of public welfare in my town. I mean, everybody has a camera, everybody's watching everything you're doing anyway. Right, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, no one else made this point before, but just to reiterate, these are being done. The technology is here, this is what happens. At this point, it's a choice of whether we're going to prosecute people as a felony for doing these things, not whether we can stop them from that. <coughs> oh, just, I'm sorry, one more quick point, just to address the issue of uh, the cell phone gun. Uh, that happened just coincidentally to be one of the issues that uh, I put in these notes. And as of July, here we go, this is from the Columbus Dispatch. As of July 29th, the issue actually came up in a, in a this Columbus, Ohio must be, um, in a case out there where that was the excuse used for confiscating the cell phone that was recording that it might have been a cell phone yet. So the, re the reporter uh, checked with their sheriff's office, but also the Bureau of uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and, and Explosives now, um, to what, see whether they had ever come across one. And they said that apparently they're made in Eastern Europe as a curiosity and there's never been one. They, they don't know of any value they want to Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Peter Dumas, and I'm with the Department of Environmental Services. I have a very particular comment uh, to, to make, uh, primarily because most of the comments uh, have, have already been made by others. Uh, we, we, can, uh, we can support the intent of, of this legislation to, you know, to, to remedy some of the problems that have arisen with Ms. Garrett's uh, situation and her arrest and some of the, uh, some of the other abuses that have been uh, mentioned here this afternoon, uh, actually going back to this morning, I guess. Um, and most of the, the concerns that we have have also been addressed uh, by Assistant Attorney General Rice and others as well. Just there's one, one aspect of that that I'd like to um, expand upon though. There are questions regarding time, place, and manner restrictions. Now, uh, generally speaking, as a, as a public agency, uh, DES and any other agency, my comments here are not specific to anything that DES does, uh, but just as a, as, a, as a general concern with unintended consequences. We have, we are open, and we have uh, open public meetings that are specifically addressed in, uh, in that section of RSA 91A. Uh, any of our administrative hearings where there's a, a few meeting cases, they're, they're all open. And certainly when we have uh, individuals who are performing their, their duties in public, inspectors, or whatever the case may be, they are in, in a public setting and open to scrutiny there. Uh, there's, there's no uh, dispute with the fact that in that capacity, any one of us is, is accountable and should be open and transparent. However, there's one concern regarding the, the, uh, the time, place, and matter that hasn't been fully addressed, at, and that is the the day-to-day -day activities that as public employees or officials, whatever the case may be, when we are in the, the more mundane aspects of our jobs, when we're in our offices. Uh, I see to my left over there uh, a sign on the door that says members and staff only. Uh, you know, there are certain areas where we operate, where the orderly administration of our business as 
as agency employees at DES or any other agency, your uh, your day-to-day -day activities uh, as members of the general court, where you, you you withdraw into a particular room or a, uh, an area of the of the building. It's a public building, nonetheless, but you may be engaged in a private conversation with a colleague. Uh, and in those instances, while we're still exercising our public uh, our public duties in the public building, uh, it's, there's by, the, by virtue of the fact that there's been a distinction in the RSA between open public meetings and these other more ministerial tasks and gatherings that we may have that aren't subject to that, I believe the current law already recognizes there's an important, uh, an important, act, uh, important attribute of being able to do that component of your work. Um, so while we support the, the openness that this, that this bill is, is attempting to, uh, to achieve, if, we, if it were enacted as written, and possibly even with some of the amendments, there could be unintended consequences of opening this, this door, the governor's door, uh, commissioners, any individual working in that semi-private, uh, you know, it's tough to say, you know, private, when we're, when we're uh, public employees. But there are functions that don't lend themselves to, to fully open scrutiny in a general sense. You know, if you, you would find it very difficult to perform our jobs if there were cameras in that room, in general access to that room, much of any commissioner or employee <coughs> to perform their functions uh, in what is ostensibly their, their, their private work area. Uh, and you know, to the extent that that can be remedied with any amendments, uh, I think uh, I think we would be we would be satisfied with that without compromising the uh, the transparency and the accountability that the that the bill in, uh, intends to achieve. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair, sir. Uh, being that you only discuss about DES or whatever you just like staff would say. Yes. What about when I see the environmentalists up my road, you know, out and doing their job, um, I don't know if it's a problem that they're being video, you know, tape or whatever they're doing, but it would be the same thing if they're out there and they're discussing an issue somewhere out in the, in the field. Somewhere. So, and uh, there'd be an audio, but they want to say things that maybe really pertain to that. that. Would that create another scenario or problem mm -hmm. for someone? It, it may. Um, uh, to, to the extent that we're talking about the broader expectation of privacy issues, I think that that's been addressed by many others here today. And uh, I, I don't know that, uh, that we have a particular concern about that aspect of it as it pertains to be, yes, yes, we have public inspectors out there. And there are general principles of expectation of privacy, you know, which, which you know, have generally been distinguished between you know, uh, video recordings on the one hand and audio recordings on the other. But the committee and general court in general is inclined to make a policy determination that that expectation of privacy is, uh, it no longer exists for a public employee. Uh, I, I, I think that, that does present somewhat of a, a, of a privacy concern for those employees. But it wouldn't be any different for DES employees than it would be for anybody else. And, and again, those those arguments have been made have been made by others. But I think that's a distinct difference between what they do in a public setting and whether they have any any expectation of privacy to the to the oral communication in, in that setting, as opposed to what happens <coughs> say, in your office or your cubicle or, or whatever the case may be. Thank you. Thank you. Can we 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 Can we